Okay, hey everybody, this is Ari. Got a new episode of the How to Adventure podcast right now. Today, we're sitting down and we're talking with Dr. Jared Anderson. Jared is a dentist and a paraglide pilot who's the national champion. He's very good. He's very technical. He's a super smart guy. He's got some good takeaways here. Talking about balance, talking about risk, talking about mindset, talking about glory. So, get ready, get a pen and a pencil to jot these takeaways down. It's going to be a good episode. Hope you enjoy it. Listen up. Here's my talk with Dr. Jared Anderson. Okay. Here we are with Dr. Jared Anderson. Thanks for being on the podcast, Jared. Yeah, you're welcome. Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think that this will be a fairly easy interview okay. to do because I'm genuinely interested in hearing these this this tale of yours. Okay. Okay, so yeah. I think that what, what is really unique about your story, what what I think my my preconceived takeaway is your balance. Right? You've had this 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 obviously you've you've done a really good job of balancing your life because you are a father, a dentist, and a national champion paraglider. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there is obviously a really good balance. And I think that the need for people to hear this is really real because I feel like the system that we live in is designed to be really polarizing mm -hmm. and it tries to dichotomize our decisions into whether you're going to have a full-time job and you're going to work all the time and stop playing, stop fucking around. Yeah. yeah. Or you're going to, you're going to reject that system and you're going to be a dirt bag. You know, you're going exactly. to be a dirt bag. You're going to live in a tent. You're going to rock climb every day <laughs> or you're going to paraglide every day. You're going to be a dirt bag. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I think your story is unique that it dispels both of those myths. You don't, you can be a professional with a career and a family as well as a sportist in the highest degree. Yep. Okay. So I think that the best way we can do this is I'd like to hear the story of, you know, the short, the short tale of why and how you became a dentist. Okay. Okay. And then I'd like to hear the short tale of why and how you became a paraglide pilot. And okay. then we'll kind of hear the, the, the rise in paragliding. And then I just like to kind of then once we hear both of those sides, We'll kind of make the connections to what it is exactly in your life that you focus on that helps you keep the balance. Okay. Okay. So let's start with learning to be a dentist. What day in your life did you realize I, you were going to be a dentist? Um, it was a progression until I finally made the choice. Uh, my dad's best friend is a dentist. And so, uh, you know, we were around him a lot and um, kind of when I was graduating high school, I was kind of floundering around. And, um, and so that's when he, you know, started kind of talking to me, what are you going to do that type of thing? And boy, I like what I do and you know, it's a good living. And so he kind of got me thinking about it. And, um, so over the years I thought about it again and again, and I kind of talked to him and, and then finally, let's see here. I would say it was right after the seven years it took me to get my four year degree. <laughs> so once, so once I finally got that degree, um, I was a landscape contractor at the time at a landscape company here in Bend. I was licensed and I was doing landscaping and that was fun. It kept me in shape, but it was never really a long-term plan of mine. Um, and so I still kind of just aimlessly wandering around. And, um, uh, once I finally got my degree, then I started to really think about things and the, the dentistry had always been this consideration, but I wasn't too serious about it. And so then I started to actually think about it and get serious about it. So I don't remember exactly the day, but it was, um, it was, I think around 96 in the fall is when it actually was. And, um, and I just decided, okay, it sounds like something that's like a great combination of things that I'm interested in. So that's when I started uh, uh, going into dental offices and observing to kind of check it out. So okay. that's pretty much right after that, I made my choice. That's what I want to do. Okay. Yeah. And not to interrupt you, but how old are you? I am 47. 47. Okay. Yep. And so you've been a dentist for how long? Uh, since 02. 
So that would be what, 15, 15 years? years only. Yeah. Yeah, 15 years. Yeah, 15 very fast years. Okay. Yeah. So, so you decided pretty late. I did. To be a dentist. I did. When I started my first year of dental school, I was 28. Um, I wasn't the oldest, but definitely I was one of the seniors in the class for sure. Okay. Yeah. Which was fun though, which was fun. Um, <laughs> those are still maybe the four best years I've ever had in my life. Um, the four years of dental school. Cause up to that point, I'd always been kind of like this student career guy. Um, didn't really go out and have a lot of fun. I was just focusing on work and focusing on getting my studies done, doing night classes, weekend classes, things like that. That's why it took me so long. Um, so not a lot of fun. Um, but then, um, when I went to dental school, I kind of sold what I had and sold my business and my equipment and things like that. And just kind of decided, you know what? Your landscaping equipment. Yeah, exactly. I saved one piece of equipment. I still have this kind of fun. But anyway, um, I just kind of decided to kind of sell out, liquidate and focus on just being a student and taking in the student life. And it just so happens that in dental school, that's a pretty fun life. Yeah. So, um, so I did that. Yeah. And that was, that was a great time. And it was in Cleveland and, um, Cleveland is surprisingly a super fun city mm -hmm. to go to school in. It was just a really good time. Um, met some really good friends, of course. And, and I was having fun learning medicine. That was a good time for me. It was interesting. And so it was, it was a good four years of my what, life. What was it about? dentistry that made you want to be a dentist was it just that you know you had this mentor or this this figure in your life who had made a success and lived a happy life as a dentist or was it the humanitarian aspect of it well there's there's it was a lot of aspects of it um you know it, it's the medicine i think is the first thing that leaps to mind um I was always interested in that. And, you know, when I was in college, I, I really loved my, you know, anatomy and physiology classes. I liked the biology. I was always kind of a scientist. So medicine, I could say, is something that I was always sort of interested in. And, um, but dentistry is kind of unique. It is a neat blend of art and science and medicine and engineering, um, psychology as it ends up. Um, and yeah, there's a humanitarian aspect to it for sure. Um, it, that career does, you know, allow us to give back very easily. You know, I can, in terms of the time that I have to do it, because, you know, we work relatively short weeks. Um, but also it's just, it's easy for me to take on a patient and do, um, you know, pro bono type work, that type of thing and help people out. It's just very easy to make a big impact. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. That's a that's a factor. Yeah. Okay. So let's hear about when did you learn about paragliding and when did you learn to paraglide? Okay. So um, I'm going to make a major HIPAA violation here. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Um, <laughs> uh, so Kevin Lee, my instructor, uh, was my patient. And so I uh, sat in the chair and of course I asked everybody, you know, like I asked some things about them and asked him what he does for a living. And he told me he's a paragliding instructor and it was just like, ding, 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 ding. You know, it's like, wow, that's very interesting. And so I, you know, I'd known a little bit about it back then, very little bit about more about hang gliding. Um, but with all the sports I'd done up to that point, um, this one just absolutely seemed like something I'd want to do. So immediately, yeah, we set up plans for me to go out and have a little discovery lesson. And, and, uh, I don't know how long after that I did that. Um, but so Kevin, course, so Kevin's laying there and he says, I, uh, yeah. I have hair guy in a line. <laughs> Exactly. Right. <laughs> okay. So when you yep. thought, when you thought that that sport would suit you, what were the other sports that you were doing at the time? Um, at the time or that like that you have done that I'd done. Oh, okay. Gosh. Well, um, as a kid, I think the first sport I did was alpine skiing. I was a racer. I did racing until I was like 16 with that. And then in, in, during those years I did, I was, you know, rode motorcycles a lot. I became obsessed with windsurfing 
in my early teen years. I did that any chance I could. It was so much fun. Where? Um, interesting. Back then, we would go up to Elk Lake. Um, we'd go out to Tumalo Reservoir. Oh, you're a Central Oregon native. Yeah, I was Central Oregon. So Tumalo Reservoir was available. That was pretty cool. And then I would, you know, scoot up to the gorge whenever I could, which wasn't as often as I liked, but I would go there occasionally. So I would say mainly Elk Lake and Tumalo Reservoir. Wow. So you're like the only person <laughs> surfing in Central Oregon. <laughs> yeah. Well, back then it was big. Really? It was huge. People yeah. were windsurfing around here? It was It was huge. Yeah, there was a huge <laughs> population of windsurfers. It was crazy. You know, we had, um, well, Ren, uh, Randy Barna had a ski shop and he had a windsurfing like Elk Lake was littered with windsurfers back in that day. Wow. It was crazy. He had this, uh, he had a school that he would be teaching people there on Sunset Beach, and and so there was a lot of windsurfing. And now there's like virtually none on that lake. I don't know when it all stopped, but it used to be huge. And then Tomalo Reservoir, we'd go out there, and there'd be 20, 30 windsurfers. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so from the time that you had that that first fill in Kevin's cavity yeah. and he tells you he's a paraglide instructor yeah. how long until you started lessons gosh I don't know for sure but I'm and how guessing... long ago was this this was 2007 so I'm not sh- I'm not <laughs> sure like... yeah it's not terribly long ago it's not that long ago no uh-uh. um, but I don't know how long after I did the lesson I can't remember what time of the year it was but I don't think it was very long I mean it had to be a couple weeks at the most just because once you set something in my mind like that it's, it's, I'm going to pounce on it, you know? Um, so it was shortly after that. I can't remember. Okay. But, and, <clears throat> and in general, have you kind of had that? I don't like the phrase addictive personality, but for me, when I find something that I really like and it like kind of sparks this fire yeah. inside of me, it's like all the other fires in my life go out. Pretty much. And I just go full throttle. Like paragliding for me, when I started paragliding, it was like, fuck skiing, <laughs> yeah. highlining can wait, I'm going to fly. Yeah, that's that's pretty much how I am. Yeah, I mean, once I got the first taste of it, um, then I was all in, you know, and just in terms of just how much I loved it. And, and yeah, and I totally did focus on getting that done, getting kicked okay, out of well, the nest. This is awesome. So, yeah. so you've been flying six seasons now. Yeah, what is it? 2007, six seasons, basically. Okay, yeah. and every person that you're racing against in at the level that you are is more experienced in the years that they've flown. Would Most you, of them. Would you find? Most of them. There's there's some there's some other guys um, out there that are doing well that are similar level of experience, and I think even Owen Schumacher, Schumacher is even a little bit less, uh-huh. and he's moving up there pretty quick. Okay. Yeah, but I say I'm one of yeah I'm one of the less experienced. Certainly, when you get on the the World Cup scene. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I'm one of the least experienced. Yeah, of sure. course. I go for to the, sure. I see the World Cup guys as the 30 year paragliders. You know, Felix has been flying since he was 10. Yeah, yeah. So many of those guys. Yeah, so many of those long, guys are just long years and years and yep. decades and decades. Yep, yep. Okay, so you mentioned something about what interests you in dentistry was it was a little bit psychology, a little bit engineering, yeah. really technical, yep. you know? It, the artistic part, I'd say, stands out, and the medical part stands okay, out. Okay, the artistic and the medical. Yeah. Okay, w- which of those elements? Uh, which of those elements really kind of manifested in paragliding? Because I, wow. I know that there's a, I know that there's a tie between these two things. Well, wow, interesting, interesting. I, you know, no one's ever posed that question to me. Because what from what I see as a dentist, you're working on very small objects, and the technique that you use to do these things is so important. Because if you fuck it up, yeah, like doing it again is like a total non-option. Oh. So like, what are the like? Is your brain? Are you really like engineering-minded person? And it must th- be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Somewhat linear. There is an artistic side to me for sure, but you just hit it. What it is, is, um, cause one of the more, um, interesting and fun parts of competition paragliding is the tweaking the gear, tweaking the instruments, dialing that stuff in, you know, and, and there's, a, there's obviously the scientific part of it, the weather and things like that. Um, but yeah, I could say one of my favorite things to do is to tweak my gear. Like I love to trim the glider with the laser. I just love doing that just because I love knowing that it's trimmed and it's kind of a fun process. Uh-huh. Um, so it's this physical process, but there's also a scientific process to it. So, you know, like when you're pulling those strings and checking the line lengths and stuff, 
there's, there's a physical and also a technical aspect to it. And I like that. It's kind of a Zen-like activity, uh -huh. but it's also very technical. So I know like in the back of my mind, yeah, this is fun. I'm trimming this thing. I'm getting it dialed so that I know that when I launch it, it's, it's perfection. And it's like one less thing to think about. It's like, it gives you a little boost of confidence. Okay. Do you do that same kind of thing in your dental practice where you totally. nerd out on the tools that you use? Totally. Totally. Yeah, I absolutely do. Like I, Early on, I adopted this technology that at the time was a little more on the fringe. Um, it wasn't, you know, fully accepted by the dental world like it is now, but it was, it's called CEREC and it makes crowns in the office in one appointment. So it takes like a block of porcelain and mills it down into this perfect crown shape and you use this, this camera scanner to scan rather than taking impressions, you use it to scan the teeth and things and then you design it on the computer screen. And so it's just totally, it's, it's exactly like that, you know, Designing your lasers. Task. Exactly. <laughs> Tiny or, tolerances. Yeah, putting your task into the Vario and, and, you know, and just all that stuff, just tweaking, tweaking those little technical things. And yeah. So that was somewhere. another question of mine. Yeah. Uh, my One of our earlier episodes, we interviewed Adam Craig, who's an Olympian mountain biker. Uh -huh. And his, the big takeaway from Adam was goals are for suckers. Goals are for suckers. <laughs> And you're going to have to listen to the episode. Interesting. It, it, Interesting. It's really good. I really like his, his look at that. Huh. And, and he's kind of more like opportunistic. He, he kind of just goes through his career waiting for the moments that he knows that he can push himself and he has the energy to give. But right. it sounds like you're a really task goal oriented person. I tend to be. Yep. I tend to, be, I, I tend to get very focused. That's the thing. Um, I, it's, it's like I set something out there. It's something I want. And it's like from point A to point B, point, point B is when I conquer it. Uh -huh. And it's kind of always in my sights, you know? So once it's in my sights, it's, it's bound to happen. Okay. So in paragliding, what was that goal? Like when you, when you started to paraglide, I think it's probably the same for all of us that right in the early stages, it's yeah. just that we want to fly. Like yep. just the thought of flight is just, yep. that's so far out there and so cool that we just want that. Right. But I found in myself that that shit wore off fast. And then I was like, okay, the, just the magic of like being up in the sky under a paraglider and sitting there and flying into the wind, that wasn't enough for me. I wanted to do tricks. I wanted to find thermals yeah. and climb and go. So what is that? What is the, what is it that you're chasing in paragliding? Well, that's interesting because when I first, the first few years that I learned, it was just the magic of it. It was just wanting to get, you know, my feet off the ground and um and improve my skills and i wanted to be able to go higher and farther and i wanted to be able to fly more with the big dogs but i wasn't competing it was just it was just the magic of the whole thing i was just so swept up in how much fun it was yeah. right and then what happened is i did my first task my first race and and that's when there was a shift mm -hmm. then it became goal oriented um that's when the other part of your brain kicked in. Yeah, and and it's interesting. I I is and I won my first task I ever did, which is really interesting. It was, awesome. it was luck, but it felt like it all made sense at the time. <laughs> um, but that was the first time I programmed something into the Vario, right? Programmed in a goal and then went chasing after it. And it was the first time I saw, you know, the Vario countdown and point an arrow and and show me the countdown to getting ready to touch the radius and then going to the next radius and that type of thing. And that was just so amazing to me so seductive i couldn't believe it. it was so cool um so that just changed paragliding for me so then after that <laughs> um i almost immediately set my sights on, okay where do you go from here you know like oh i'm looking and oh yeah there's this world cup circuit and then there's this thing called the super final and then there's this and that and it's like yeah okay so right about then i have to admit that's the goal that's pretty much where i wanted to go <laughs> with it you know because that's where that's where the upper levels were you know what i mean that's where it was possible to go and it looked like fun. I mean, if it didn't look like a lot of fun to me, obviously I wouldn't be chasing it. But I saw, you know, we had a guy in 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 that area, um, Hayden Hayden Glotty, who who had been at that world level, you know, and the national level. He's you know one of the best paragliders in the United States. And I was I was flying with him, and he was amazing. But it wasn't until I saw, you know, the, the competition part of it, um, that uh, where was I going with that? <laughs> It kind of switched it to being like a task oriented, goal oriented. Yeah, like where I could see. Okay, I'm sorry. It's the people that were up at those upper levels. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. That's why I brought him into it because he he was at that upper level as well, and um, I saw him in a different light. You know, he was 
it was kind of an example of like where it goes and how it works. You know what I mean? And and so I, then I started to see these other pods, these other names of these people that are now my friends on the World Cup scene. And I was just like, wow, that, yeah, that looks like the level I want to be. That looks like fun. So that's the kind of flying you want to do. That's, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, so now I think I want to hear what, what, what in paragliding makes you, does anything in paragliding make you a better dentist? And by being a dentist, do you think it improves your paragliding? Oh, that's a good question too. Um, like, do they complement one another? Do they support one another? I think, I think the mental aspect of it is where they help each other. Mm-hmm. I really do. Um, because, yeah, because a lot of the same type of discipline and maturity and patience um, that you need to excel in paragliding is, is definitely, it definitely um, is applicable to dentistry and at least as a, the owner of a business, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which I am and, and vice versa. Um, so both of those things I've been maturing in, in both aspects, those aspects of my life. Um, and, and they've been kind of helping out, you know, it's nothing like paragliding, you know, like bombing out on a task and watching all the other guys fly over your head, you know, such an ego game. It's such an ego game. And when you bomb out, your ego is just screaming at you. It's just screaming. And it takes so much to, um, to just chill yourself out and just relax and just say, okay, this, you know, I bombed out today. I'm going to show up tomorrow and do my best again tomorrow, you know, and it just, it takes a lot to just kind of calm yourself down. And, you know, you run into a lot of those in dentistry as well, both as an, as an, as an employer and a leader, but also just as a dentist and dealing with patients, you get a lot of opportunity, um, to just calm down your emotion and calm down your ego and just kind of chill yourself out and, and look at the big picture. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. And I think that that's a great kind of segue into, <clears throat> um, I think when you talk about patience and you talk about experience and talking about getting your ego out of the way yeah. in paragliding, that is kind of how you stay safe. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, so now I kind of want to talk to you about risk management. And yeah. I think that you have, um, you, you bought a practice this year. Yes, I did. The same year that you won the national championships, right? Uh, that's, yeah, right. Almost the same time. Yeah. Okay. So that's, in my mind, I see a really beautiful balance of your efforts and that mm-hmm. your, your brain is working on multiple things at the same time. Yeah. But you've also, whether you see it as, as this or not, you have, you have mitigated risks in business, whether that's like for providing for your family, you know, yeah. whether you should be staying at the, at the the office that you're working at where it's secure or should you go out and do this new thing on your own? It's kind of, that's like the managing the business risk. Does the paragliding where you have a risk of fucking dying, <laughs> yeah. like does that teach you about the business risk and vice versa? Um, and how do you mitigate either of those? How do I mitigate either That's a one? huge question. I know I just rambled for 90 seconds. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. <laughs> okay. So paragliding, how do you mitigate the risks paragliding? Because obviously, as a father, some people even think it's irresponsible for you to be paragliding. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I know the juice is worth the squeeze. Yeah, it's. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm, that's just the way I've been. I was a rock climber in my life too, you know. So I've I've always done kind of things like that. I, granted, paragliding is kind of pushing it on the edge there. It's definitely a very dangerous sport. Um, how do I mitigate my risk? Um, in paragliding. Again, I learned to calm down my ego. I learned to keep it all in perspective. I learned to remember why I'm out there and that is to have fun. That is the bottom line. Ultimately, you know, I love to win. I love to do well. I love to achieve in that sport. Um, But I don't love it enough to take crazy risks, at least not anymore. I think several years ago, I took maybe a few more risks than I do now. Um, But the bottom line is, and that's one of the things like when I bomb out, and it's testing my ego. This one of the mantras I have that I say to myself is, "Hey, you know, you've got a you've got a son, you have a great business, and you have this life. Keep it in perspective. There's more to winning this task. There's more to winning this comp. Um, you're out here to have fun. Keep it in perspective, and that usually calms me down. You know, it's it's nice. Like when I leave that comp, whether I've done well or not, I have this life that I love to go home to." 
And so mm-hmm. that allows me to both, you know, calm down if it doesn't go as well as I want it to, or to keep myself calm instead of going into dangerous situations. It's easy for me to, at a certain point to slide off and say, okay, call it. Yep. I'm going to go over here at the risk of landing, or I'm going to go land. And I'm all right with that because my life as a whole, it's all good. I don't need this to walk away happy. Win, lose or draw, going to be happy either you way. You got it. You got it. So, and, and and that very much conflicts with my competitive personality. Yeah, it does. It really does. But you know, I'm 47. And so <laughs> it's like, okay. Um, I've had lots of good success in sports in the past. You know, I've had enough to keep me happy. So this is all just icing on the cake if it happens. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and so the, the risk and tell me, tell me about your assumed risk with, with purchasing the second business, the second business. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you think of that as a risky proposition? Oh, absolutely. Or? Absolutely. And it's kind of funny because initially when I was in the process of purchasing the practice, you know, it's over a period of months that it all happens, but initially it was all just ambition, right? I was just looking at all the positives and, you know, and knowing about the potential negatives, but it was really funny when it was a week before the actual purchase happened that week, I hardly slept at all. And that was all me being kept awake by all the possible negatives. <laughs> you know, there's just all of a sudden there's this bucket of ice water that was thrown on me and I was like, holy cow, what if this and what if that? And oh my gosh, consequences, you know, because it was huge. It wasn't a small practice. It was huge practice that I purchased. Um, so it was way out of my comfort zone and way out of my familiarity. And um, and so, you know, it's just th- there were bottom line is there's some unknowns. I'm starting to work with people I've never worked with before, you know, doing a transaction that I've never done bigger than I've ever done. And so there were some unknowns and um, that hit me pretty hard like the week before and the first few days. But then I keep telling myself, just go in there and do what you know how to do. You can do this. Just do what you know how to do. Whenever I put my mind to things and I give my best effort consistently, my best honest effort, things 99% of the time work out for the better. They just do. I right? love that. And, and that's the way it's always been for me. So then I kind of fall back on that and I would just go in there maybe with a blindfold, but I just went in there and did it. And it was amazing. Within a few days, it was like, ah, oh, this weight came off my shoulders and a lot of great things fell into place, you know, and I just kind of kept focused every day on just doing what I know how to do and doing a great job and having a good attitude. And, um, you know, every day it's just been getting better and better. Um, Okay. Do you think that, do you think that your life of sporting, whether that's rock climbing or your career as a paraglide pilot has prepared you for those types of situation where you have fear in a business decision where you're like, okay, it sounded really great. Now I'm up in the air on this business deal and there's a lot of bad places to land. Um, absolutely. You know, I feel like in my, in my life, sport has taught me to be the person that I am like when, you know, as far as fear management, as far as like anything good in life is going to be with a, a pretty decent dose of fear or self doubt or any of these things. And I credit my sports with just training my mind to deal with the stress of fear and the stress of unknown. And once you, once you start to deal with that, you start to crave it. And that right there, what we're talking about, that's how I define adventure, right? It's a, it's a thing that we do with risk with an uncertain outcome. That's right. So we're looking, we kind of like get addicted to these, these, these adventures, right? And you yeah. kind of took a adventure in the business. Yeah. Did, do you think that the that the adventures that you took prior to that business adventure trained you to deal and make make the best of it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. On a micro and a macro scale, you know, one thing that leaps to mind is really interesting is is rock climbing. You know, rock climbing was the the most profound um, lesson that I ever had in persistence paying off is I'll never forget. Like when I started learning that sport, the thing that really struck me about it is I would walk up to a, to a problem, right? I'd walk up to a climb and, or just a problem on a wall and I would look at it and try it and I would utterly fail, right? Like you do the first time you walk up to something that's hard, you utterly, (laughs) you, you get on it and you're like, this is impossible. 
<laughs> it's a five nine and you're like this is impossible i can't do this it's totally and then someone comes up and goes oh yeah do you see that little knob there just put your right hand there and then put your toe over on this thing and they're like boom then you pull through it and you're like wow so what five minutes ago was impossible is now completely possible because i stuck with the problem i learned how to solve it Climbing demonstrates that better than any sport I've ever been involved in my life, any activity I've ever been involved in my life. And I think that's one of my favorite things about rock climbing. That's what really sucked me in at the time. So it really taught me how to go into the unknown and something that seems impossible, figure it out, keep going. Somewhere in there is a solution. So that's one example of how a sport taught me something very valuable in life that I used uh, you know, just a little while ago when I purchased this practice. Yeah. Right. And then so many other lessons, you know, persistence over time, um, you know, uh, keeping your eye focused on the goal and not getting sidetracked, that type of thing. Um, yeah. So sports, absolutely. And sports, you know, as a young kid, um, it was something, it was like almost a crutch for me um, to boost my self-esteem. There were times where it was challenged, you know, and sports was kind of something I was always somewhat good at. And so I would use that sometimes to kind of boost my mood and boost my, uh -huh. yeah, my self-confidence. I think that's an important lesson that we should, as a, as a, as a people need to be teaching more. Yeah. I've always made the connection to people that it's really important to have something that you do that threatens your life. Yeah. Like physically. You know, whether that's rock climbing or mountain biking or skiing or yeah. paragliding, you have to like, first of all, realize your self-preservation so that you can start to learn how to take risks because all of life is risks. Yeah. Sitting on your couch is a risk, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think, I think you might be a more, um, a more uh, exuberant demonstration of that. You know, like you, you seem to take a lot of, you know, your highliner and things like that. And, and I think you're right in a certain sense. And I, I would say in my, in my um, personal experience, I subdue that a little bit, you know, like when I'm out there taking the risks, I'm wanting to amp up the adrenaline, but without, but I'm not thinking as much of putting myself out there in the danger in order to get that stimulus, not quite as much with me. I, I tend to do these dangerous sports, but I feel like, you know, like when you're climbing, I'm, I'm checking the gear and I'm strapped in and I was never a trad climber. I was always a sport climber, you know, cause I felt that was safer and I felt I was locked in, you know, and that type of thing. And, and so I, I tend to err on the side of caution, but then, then look at me, I do all these crazy sports. They're so dangerous. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. I must, I guess I do love that sensation of adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I think people, people always say to me that I must be an adrenaline junkie. And I tell them, no, if you're feeling adrenaline, you just like lost at the game. You're either like your paragliders like collapsed and spinning or That's some kind of so crazy true. thing and you get adrenaline yeah. or like on a high line, if you have adrenaline, you're hanging in the bottom of your leash because you just fell off of the thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, I, 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 for me, skiing is my most adrenaline you know, it's yeah. the fastest, most adrenaline. Oh yeah. Me. That is, it's fun to go that fast on your feet, isn't no it? Kidding. No kidding. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Moving on. Yes. Last year you were the holder of the Oregon state distance record. <laughs> Briefly. Briefly yeah. before our mutual friend, Matt Henze yeah. <laughs> broke it by just a little blip. And then a couple weeks later he crushed it. He crushed it. Yeah. Okay. So, yep. Talk to me about what it is that makes you want to break a record of any kind, let alone uh, compared to other people. You know, are you trying to are you trying to better yourself? Or are you trying to? Oh, you know, what's the what's the draw for the for the record run? Because these are flights you're not like these are flights that you're doing by yourself. Yeah, and your wife or your son is chasing you on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the draw to trying to break the state record? I have to admit. Much of the draw is the glory. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. The glory and the notoriety. <laughs> it's fun, and that is a big part of the draw. <laughs> but getting back and beating Matt Henze. Oh, getting, yeah. I mean, getting the could, record back. If you could see, I don't know if you ever saw his blip when he won it, when he beat it the first time. His little selfie video that he did um, right after he landed, and he knew he broke it. I didn't see. No, it's pretty classic. <laughs> It's He's, pretty classic. You got to look that one up. It's really funny. your nose in it. If you want an example of uh, we do this for the glory, that's a good example. 
I laughed my head off when I saw that. Um, but yeah, Glory is it's huge. Notoriety, it's huge. It's neat to see my name on the record thing. That's awesome. There was a little story written up about it in the magazine. That was great. That felt good. But when I'm in the air, it's just about the flight. You know, the, the day that we did that, um, you know, it was unsure on launch. The weather was a little bit questionable looking on launch, not on the forecast. But um, once I got in the air and kind of got the rhythm down and knew that this might happen, then it, it was just all about the flight. It was just the glory of the flight. It was so much fun. That's awesome. Yeah. It was just yesterday I had a conversation with my friend Wes and I kind of <clears throat> said that in my mind, progression isn't the moment that you like break the record. It's the opportunity. It's the opportunity to break the record that's really addicting. It's the yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the getting another chance. Whether it's whether it's trying to beat your record or beat someone else's record or go further than you've ever gone. Yeah. But it's those what I get really excited about, and I'm gonna put myself in your shoes, is that when I you know, I launch and I'm already been flying for a while and I start to see the stars align and I know that, okay, this is possible. I, I have an opportunity here. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That is, that is, that is huge. Um, for sure. And, and another thing that I think about when, you know, like n now that w when we're breaking records, it's, it's neat to show what's possible. Right. So for, for Pine Mountain, I extended it out a little bit beyond what was there for several years before. And then now that Matt has pushed it out like 50 K past that, he's really raised the bar a long way. Um, it's, I think a lot of us kind of already knew that that was possible for pine, but now we really know it's possible, right? It's, it, it's, it's like, it's right there in front of us. So we know. Yeah. So it's the mental stretch to go that far is no longer so big. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not a big mental leap of faith that we can do that flight. It's like very, very possible. So now, now it's almost like an expectation. Yeah. The faith is gone. Yeah. It's like, now I know, at least it, I'm convinced in my mind, um, that yeah, 285 totally doable. We can do this, you know, even though he's the only one who's done it. Um, it's, okay. it's possible. And just before we came in here, you started to tell me a story about a day last year where you kind of start, saw some stars align yeah, but other stars weren't in in line <laughs> in terms of preparation. <laughs> tell me, tell me that story. Tell me that story. Yeah, that was that was so funny. Um, early spring, relatively early spring. Um, yeah, forecast looking decent, not terribly high cloud base, but fairly good. Ten, eleven thousand possible, right? Possible, but the cloud streets looked amazing on launch, and so for whatever reason, I was out there kind of by chance. Um, so I didn't spend a lot of time preparing. I guess I didn't think it was going to be a big day um, until I was up on launch. And then I got up on launch and learned that I had forgotten to bring water and I had forgotten to bring food. And I didn't have the little pee tube that I like to have when I'm in flight. So I was just prepared for a couple hours at best. <laughs> and, I didn't, you know, even when I was launching, I was like, okay, well, yeah, I'll do a couple of hours or whatever, and then I'll land on the road, and that'll be it. And then, of course, I got up, and it was just epic. It just was epic. And every every thermal just got better and better. And next thing you know, I'm flying over Burns. And How the, far is that? That's, what is that? Burns is like 150K, I think. And so I was like maybe just under four hours into it and famished and parched <laughs> and freezing and had to pee and was just getting pinged into orbit <laughs> over burns. I couldn't come down if I tried, you know, I, it was unbelievable. I hit this amazing convergence and, and the cloud base I thought was, it forecasted to maybe go to like 11.6. Well, I'd hit that, but when I got to burns, I hit this just amazing uh, convergence area and I got up to like 13 and a half thousand wow. feet and was flying out of the lift, you know, and, oh man, it was, it was incredible. And then I looked off to the east and the cloud streets just went in this line off into the distance, you just know, begging you to go. presumably, yeah, <laughs> just like begging you to go. The Oregon border was beckoning, you know, and who knows, but it, who knows a lot further, let's put it that way, a lot further than where I was, uh, just because the conditions were perfect and they were turned on and I was bonked and I was kind of shaking cause I was cold. 
and I knew that I felt insecure more so than I normally do in that type of turbulence. I felt like I wasn't on top of it because I was malnourished and, and parched. So underprepared. I was underprepared. And who knows if I'd have gone further than my record at the time, but I know I'd have gone a lot further than I was. And so anyway, I spiraled down and landed. It was a good choice. <laughs> Live to fly another day. Okay, so hopefully next year in the spring. Yeah. Remember your kit. Always be prepared. <laughs> you're going to remember your kit yeah. and you're going to get another day with the stars aligned. <laughs> Just never get too whimsical. You know, I think what you should do is you and Matt Hensey need to get together and you guys just need to team up. Yeah. So you guys are using the, the team, the new team thing, which has been the the technique for breaking the world record here for the last four or five records that have been broken is all the team based flying where, yeah, you know, you're using the other pilots to mark out the climbs and. I, no, I, I completely, know the I completely agree with you. I think the team way would be a great to do, a great way to do but it. But it's less glory. Well, no, I mean, no, I'm all right with that. But convincing, convincing Henzi to fly with you is a whole nother challenge on itself. It might be more difficult than breaking the actual record. Is he loves to fly alone and he does really well with it. It is funny. And when we were in Valle just recently, he and I flew up to the volcano, which is a pretty nice cross country. And, um, and we, I flew with him and I was kind of surprised that he hung with me, you know, um, at a certain point he kind of flew solo again. But after we did that flight, he actually made the comment, wow, you know, that was actually really fun sharing that flight with you. You know, he's, it's like, that was fun flying together. <laughs> he I'm was like, surprised. Yeah, it's, it's, it really works. <laughs> but I think ultimately, yeah, when he gets on launch, he likes to fly solo and he does a really good job with it, but he is, I've raced with him a lot. And he's a great guy to have in the gaggle. As Matt is just a bulldog and he pushes and um, and he you know leads out and he pushes and he finds things and uh, it would be great. I would love to be able to fly and share a record flight with him because I think um, the two of us could work together and do a great job with it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Switching gears a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to talk about your travels in mm -hmm. paragliding mm -hmm. and how the dangerous thing that you're doing for fun with an uncertain outcome applies just even going, let alone the paraglide flights themselves. So what what were the, just like, what was the kind of brief list of the places you went in 2016, you know, the last 18 months flying, and what was your favorite place? Oh, okay. Well, um, 2016, where did I, I didn't do a lot in 2016, where did I go? How about I, I'll rewind it a little further back. Is yeah, that all right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I think my first World Cup was 2014, and that was in Argentina. So then I went from there to France. Um, and then Super Final was in Turkey that year. I've been to Colombia numerous times. And I'd say... Uh, yeah, the World Championships was in 2015 was in Colombia. Just went to Valle, been there several times. And I'm trying to think of where else did I compete. That's basically it. You went to the the Canary Island, didn't you? Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, I went to uh, I went to Reunion Island. Reunion Island. Yeah, which is just east of Madagascar, a French island. Um, what was that like? Was, I have no idea what that did. It's, it was know. cool. It was cool. The island itself was like, it reminded me of um, geologically like Hawaii, but culturally like some kind of French European village type setting. Really? Yeah. So it was kind of a neat combination. And the flying was, yes, yeah, it was okay. You know, it was scenic. It was warm. It was fun. It was fun to be there doing it. But, you know, it's not a place that I would travel with my paraglider on purpose. You know, I went there for the World Cup, but um, the flying was marginal, I think. Yeah. It wasn't like big mountain type flying or big cross countries. It all kind of took place in a very relatively small area. Yeah. So there wasn't. Uh, so what, yeah. what part in, in those travels, what part does the culture play for you? Are you kind of, and I could see you being this way, like really nose to the grindstone. Yeah. You know, you're the guy that's going to go out and when he gets there, he's going to figure out the the routes and spend his, his downtime really figuring out the flights. Yeah, I did that more early on. Um, yeah, sometimes I'll do some recon, 
before I go, um, I like to look at the thermal maps. You know, go on to that uh, thermal program off of Leonardo where the guy mapped all the thermals over, over time. And so I'll kind of check out the site. I'll look at former track logs of comps if I can and look at the general area and try to see where some of the thermal hotspots are. But really, it's it's really hard to remember any of those things. You really just need to get out there and do a couple of practice days. But I will do that recon sometimes. Yeah, and at that point, you're kind of going just by principle. You're just reading yeah. the ground and you know where you're going by feel. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, flying with some locals or other people that have flown it. Okay. Well, I think that's really good. That's a really good, pretty well-rounded look at where you're at. Yeah. And I really liked what you said early on when I asked you about why you wanted to do dentistry. And you mentioned that it's something where the the gradient of knowledge is so enormous yeah. between you and your patient right. that you have the ability to do such great impacts with just doing what you do yeah. for free. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And so... First of all, let's just, I just want to hear kind of like what, what that side of things is about for you. You mean the, the, the donation of my time and my, yeah, as, yeah. A, as a doctor, how do you give back? And obviously you are, and I've said this about myself and my friends and the people that are kind of living the kind of lives that we are. I think that as far as humanity and in all of humanity, in all of time that people have been alive, as far as quality of life goes, here we are, the tip of the fucking spear. Yeah. We got it the best anyone's ever had it. This is true. The most dynamic lives where you get to you get to do your crazy family thing, you get to yeah. nerd out on your dentistry thing and, and make, yeah. r- be really proud of your work, as well as have this incredible dream life where you travel around the world flying paragliders. Yeah. So talk to me about the importance in your life of giving back and doing good things for people. Yeah, well... Um, your son's going to listen to this in a decade. Yeah, don't right. fuck it up. Yeah, I'll try not to. Um, I don't know. It just it just feels good to help people. It feels good when you're making that impact. I like the response I get from people when you're helping them. You know, um, since I've become a dentist, it's just empowered me to help in ways that I haven't been able to before, you know, to make this big impact. Um, when I was a student and also when I first became a doctor, I would travel to the Dominican Republic with a group of other dental students. And there was a clinic set up in, uh, in Santo Domingo. And we go there and just for one week, we do nothing but just do free dentistry um, on hundreds of people, you know, from morning till night. Um <clears throat> And we all just wanted to go back and do it again and again. And it's just super, super fun, you know, because it's just this wonderful group of people that we're serving and they have, there's a huge need and they're super appreciative and you can tell you're making a good impact on them. And that's just, it's just super fun. You know, it's like I can do this thing that would otherwise be either completely inaccessible or really expensive for them. Totally. And it's boom, we can just give it to them. And so it's a huge impact in a short period of time. And, and then, you know, since I've been, you know, as a professional you know, with a business, I, I pretty much throughout my career, there's always been at least one person in my practice that I'm doing free work for. So I'll pick somebody. A lot of times people will come to me and I'll just kind of say, okay, I'll help you. You know, but there's usually at least one that I'm always working on right now. There's this gentleman that I've been helping and we basically been going step by step and, and basically re, 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 uh, refurbishing his whole mouth, you know? Wow. And so, um, before that, I've had single moms. I've had, you know, various different people. And there's usually some story to their life um, that resonates with me. And and I just like to, and that's kind of the, the other way that I give back. Well, I'm glad <clears throat> to hear that. And thank yeah. you. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. That's yeah. awesome. So on that topic, I figure we can just kind of spitball here on the podcast and people can listen into our spitball. But I had this idea mm-hmm. that I think I may or may not have passed by you. But as you know, uh, I started that nonprofit last year, Flight for the Cause, mm-hmm. where we're athletes using the power of flight to do good. And then in 2016, I was just totally blessed to do all this awesome traveling with my paraglider. And I've kind of realized the kind of way I want to travel. And it is starting with an amazing culture, 
right? Because I want to yeah. dive into the culture. Yeah. I also <clears throat> want to really experience the cuisine in a in a deep, yeah. profound way. I yeah. love food. Yeah. And and the the culture, the cuisine, and I I have to have a sport. Like I, I'll never get on a plane ever again without. My slack line, my paraglider, yeah. my skis, something. I have like a goal, right? It's right. like, it's a, it makes it an adventure. Right, right. My sport is going to make that an adventure. But I've also realized that if I'm going to go to these places, like I'm so privileged in my daily life, let alone my dream life where I get on an airplane and fly to the other side of the world to go paragliding, right. that it's, it only makes sense that I would be giving back. I would be doing yep. something that giving back. So next week I'm going to fly to Mexico. I've got this cool project that I've linked up with these other nonprofits in central Mexico. And we're going to go do this big cleanup on there. They have like this mountain that's just right outside the city that everyone goes and hikes on. And there's just trash everywhere. So we're going to go clean it up in a day. And yeah. there's also a, a launch at the top of the mountain. So oh, cool. Trying to fly off with the other local pilots. <clears throat> My idea for you and I, what we would do, and I, uh, I already reached out to Jamie and Isabella Messenger, who, oh, right. yeah, yeah. as you know, yeah. are probably the leading paraglide philanthropists yeah. in the world. And they're in Pokhara, Nepal. Yep, yep. So I was thinking that, uh, you know, we could get some funds together for some supplies and we could go to Pokhara on a paragliding trip. Yeah. Okay. And let's say we're going to be there for six days. So we'll do three afternoon or four afternoons of free dental clinics. Yeah. Right? Are you into that? Yeah. You know, that's funny because I've already thought about that. And um, knowing that Jamie and Isabella are there and having experience going to the Dominican Republic and, of course, Pokhara. Holy cow. We're going <laughs> Who doesn't on... want to fly to, in, in Pokhara? <laughs> yeah, we're going on a paragliding trip, Jared. But, we're going to do good things while we're there. But, but I we're did, going on a paragliding trip. You no, know, I had thought about that. You know, it's, it's really funny. I had thought about that very thing because, you know, especially with the earthquake that happened and all that. And um, it just looks like a place where that type of thing could be set up and it would be a great thing to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I absolutely totally would be interested in doing something like and that. You bet. Hearing <clears throat> hearing your experience from the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. obviously you you have the firsthand experience at running a free clinic in yep. a third world country, yep. working on teeth that you don't really see here in Bend, Oregon, I'm sure. Yeah, well, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yes and no. It's, it's an interesting study, you know, when you're when you're in a country like that, it's a very interesting study in, in dietary habits. Yeah. You know, I learned a lot from that. It was really fascinating. But yeah, okay. you know, yeah, I do know, you know, and it was a buddy of mine in dental school who actually set up that clinic in, in the DR and, um, and so setting it up is not something that I've a lot of experience in, but it's, you know, it, it can, it's something that could be done. Okay. Sure. Well, I'm excited to yeah. talk to you more and get that, get that set up. We'll talk yeah. to Jamie and Isabella and see what kind of needs they have. And then I just refer to you and what kind of supplies. And I think I've got a pretty good lead on how we can get all the supplies funded and whatever we yeah. I mean, if there's more dentists we want to take over there, or if there's some, yeah. some nurses. I mean, my friend is just learning how to paraglide. She's a vet. And I think she would be into, she's an emergency room vet. So I think she would travel around and fix cats and dogs and we could fix teeth and. Yeah. Well, they're, and they're, they're, uh, they're, um. Scavenger birds are at risk there, right? The oh, vultures yeah. and things. Those those yeah, guys. Yeah, para hawking. Yeah, we'll yeah. go para hawking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Jared. Well, it's been amazing. I've had a great time hearing yeah. your story. I'm really proud of you. Thanks. You've you've uh, kept such a great balance. I try, I try. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever think of it as balance? Oh, absolutely. Or do you think of it as okay? I got to do my. I got to do, get in there and knock out my dental work so I can go paragliding again no 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 it's it's a balance because i love all of it you know um this this acquisition and you know moving back to my hometown to bend and working here um has definitely it's improved my career I, i'm having more fun as a dentist than i've ever had in my entire life that's awesome by a long shot by a long shot i really really am enjoying it like i never have before um so i have this love for my career and and I really, I really covet that. I really like that, you know, so I do want to balance that. But then of course, paragliding, holy cow. Dream world. Always love that. <laughs> Dream you know, world. Favorite activity I've ever done, bar none. Favorite activity, favorite sport by a long shot. And um, so it's like, 
Yeah, I like to balance both because I want to do well at both. I want to nurture both of them and preserve both of them. Okay, and if yeah. you were to give someone a tip, this is the person that you're giving a tip to hypothetically used to rock climb as a kid, but then got a job and it's been like a decade since they've really dedicated time to like their sports. You know, they still have their climbing gear. They might own a season pass for the resort and go skiing a couple times a year. But like, I feel like there's so many people out there who have lost their adventurous spirit and they've lost the balance. They totally are sucked into their jobs. Tell me, give me your, give me your best tip uh, for the balance. Wow. Um, wow. That's a, that's a, that's a very, another very good question. I think, you know, I think, I think originally the paragliding, one of the things that was, it was so great about it for me is it helped me deal with the stress of my career because that's the one thing I haven't really mentioned here, but dentistry, you know, those, those rumors you hear about dentists, it's true, you know, high suicide rate. Well, I don't know if I could validate that, but it's, uh, if that's true, I wouldn't be surprised. It's very high stress. And so the paragliding, uh, was a way for me to instantly distress instantly um but as far as balancing those things um gosh you know i think and also family too which is another one i think just kind of keeping everything in perspective yeah you know it's just i don't and that's if you bring up an interesting point it's something i wanted to talk about you know like when, when i when i go to the world cups you know i do have to get somewhat realistic here I want to do as well as I can. Um, but the guys who are winning, they're, they're flying almost every day. They're and not they're, dentists. No, they're not dentists. They're, <laughs> you know, the guys in the top 10, you know, I, I haven't done any research, but just from kind of what I've observed, they're they're flying all the time. They're test pilots. They're team pilots. They're professional They're professional paragliders. That's the bottom line. Do you consider yourself a professional paraglider? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, pseudo, almost. Yeah. Your um, professional level, you are trying without you're, being employed as a paraglider. That's right. Yeah, and and I kind of never would want that. I don't want my job to be this thing that this hobby that I have. I want it to just be this hobby that I always love to go out and do. <laughs> it's my source of de stress. See, I think that right there, you just nailed it right there. Perhaps. That's the that's the key right there. That those two things, these two dichotomies yep. in your life, not only are they the yin and the yang, but they're the yang and the yin. Yeah. It. One of them, one of them excites you to get outside and to de-stress. Yeah. And the other one de-stresses you to the point that you can get back into the, yeah. the career. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, like I said, you know, there's parts of my career that I'm, I'm experiencing joy from that I haven't before. And I think it's, it is because I'm balancing it out. It's because I'm taking a different perspective. It's because I've matured. Um, I've learned to calm down. And so it allows me, because like when I sit down, for instance, when I sit down to do dentistry, I get in the same type of Zen pattern that I do when I'm flying in thermals and things like that. It, the physical act of it is very, it can be very calming to me. You know, I just, I really like it. And I just kind of get into this groove and I really enjoy it. It's very, very satisfying to do it. Flow state. Yeah, it really is. It's a flow state for sure. Um, but, you know, I think just keep in perspective. Um, if you want to be the best at something, bottom line is you got to put time into it, mental and physical time. That's the bottom line. I want to be the best that I can with the time that I have, but I'm willing to accept less than the best because I want to balance it out. I've got a kid, I've got a career that I love, and, and I just want to make sure I can do all those things really well. Well, I would consider you a very high level adventure artist. And that's something I think you should be proud of yourself for. Yeah, I am. I'm, I am. Yeah, the recent very successes I've had have been very satisfying, and I've been allowing myself to sit back and enjoy it that's great yeah well thanks so much i think yeah. that i think that the things that you said can have big impacts on people's lives well i hope so i hope so thanks for being on the podcast yeah you're very welcome my you're pleasure right. all right there it was that was a great conversation with jared pretty inspirational guy hope you guys got all that on the next episode of the How to Adventure podcast, I'm going to tell you my first story. The first story is going to be about a Mexican knife fight in Valle de Bravo. It's kind of crazy, so stay tuned. We'll see you next time. Thanks.